I'm the author of a new book called Sinostan, China's Inadvertent Empire, which is a book that I actually co-authored with a dear friend of mine, Alexandros Peterson, who was very sadly killed about seven years ago. Um, the book uh, draws on 10 years uh, or more, actually, of research uh, that I undertook with Alex and then subsequently with other colleagues and by myself in Central Asia. One of the big themes they were trying to look at within this book, which is basically trying to understand how China's influence in this part of the world, with which it shares a border and has shared a border, of course, uh, forever, um, is growing and has been growing over time. Uh, initially, China's relations with Central Asia were formed in the wake of the Cold War. Um, and what we initially saw was a set of relationships that were very much about border delineation and very much of a case of influence going from the region into China and trying to try to strike a balance of its sort of distant borders in Xinjiang and trying to understand how we would manage these borders with these newly emerging countries uh, from the uh, former Soviet Union. As time went on, uh, this relationship changed. And as China's economy grew, uh, it became a relationship much more of China increasingly exerting influence over the region and increasingly its economic presence being felt across the region. And that is very much the big theme of trying to look at this book. What is the consequence and what does it mean that China is becoming the most important and influential and consequential actor on the ground? Uh, there's a kind of long-standing tense relationship that there has been with Russia, which has traditionally been the stronger power in the region. And we try to explore that in the book, trying to understand how this power dynamic plays out. Um, and this is an important lesson, I think, for today in particular, when we look at Ukraine, where we can see that there's a China-Russia dynamic playing out there as well. But within the Central Asian context, what was fascinating is to try to understand from the ground up how it was that China was really reshaping this area on the ground and increasingly becoming just such an important player. And this is something that we found in every domain. And we tried to explore this through travel around the region, meeting people, uh, exploring places, going to border posts, going to talk to officials, uh, both in China, but also across the region. And trying to understand from them, but also from the traders who are actually going back and forth and doing the trading on the ground, or the workmen who are building the roads and infrastructure. Um, and the key lesson for us was that what you had here was a case of China increasingly trying to invest heavily in its own Western regions of Xinjiang. And as this investment was increasing, it needed a kind of outlet to go into. Uh, Xinjiang is as landlocked as the five Central Asian countries that it's next to. And the purpose of China's investment there was very much about trying to ultimately help make Xinjiang a more prosperous place. From China's perspective, Xinjiang is a region which you know, has always been part of China, but has always had a very tense relationship with the center and has at its core uh, a relationship between an ethnic uh, minority Uyghur community and an increasingly majority Han uh, community. Um, and this tension has spilled over into violence. Violence that really reached a recent apex in 2009 with widespread rioting that led to hundreds of deaths in Urumqi. In the wake of that, we see a massive push by China to try to invest in the region. And as this investment went into the region, we see it overspilling into Central Asia. Because ultimately, if you're going to try to develop prosperity into Xinjiang, you're going to have to try to make the regions around it better connected and more prosperous as well. Um, and this would ultimately help Xinjiang become more stable and prosperous. Um, and it was in 2010 that we started to do this research, sort of after the big surge we see in the wake of 2009. And we can really see that in the subsequent decade or more, uh, that this influence has only grown. And now we can see that China is increasingly the most important trading partner for all these countries. It's often the biggest investor uh, or a major investor into all of these economies. And what's interesting is this investment comes in all sorts of shapes and forms. It's not only in the big infrastructure investment that we all traditionally associate with the uh, uh, Belt and Road Initiative, but it also comes in terms of much more low level uh, investments as well. And I think this is the point, and this is what the book is trying to explore. Understanding the many different la layers that there are to Chinese investments and relationships in this region, stretching from everything from the economic side to the political side, but also increasingly to the security side. And I'll end by briefly mentioning uh, Afghanistan, which is a key sort of chapter within the book. Uh, it's a region that sits adjacent to Central Asia and is increasingly becoming more important. And what's interesting there is that there, the issues that China has and the region has with Afghanistan are very much security related. And one of the interesting questions that we sort of left with at the end of this book was, what does it mean where China is becoming the most consequential actor on the ground, but in such a way that it's clearly not a priority to Beijing? And yet it's a region that's riven with security problems. They're really epitomized by what we see happening in Afghanistan. Um, and this plays into the sort of central theme that we talked about in the book, which is the idea of China's inadvertent empire. So that is the book. Uh, I would encourage you to go and buy a copy. I tell your friends to. And thank you very much.